In uh, the first chapter of Ephesians so far, Paul has been talking about how the Trinity has been involved in our salvation and how they've each played their part. And now he's going to say a prayer for the believers there in Ephesus uh, to draw near to God, to be able to uh, get to know him better. Well, let's, let's read this beginning in verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he was raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word and how it instructs us, gives us the, the basis for the things that we believe and that we can cling to. And Lord, just seeing uh, this, these passages as Paul has presented that, that uh, you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have all played a part in our salvation and the hope that gives and the, uh, the endurance that that engenders in us as we live out this life. We're, we're in an imperfect world. We're in a, a crazy world sometimes, but yet we know that you have a plan. And we know that you're working it out. We pray that you'd help us to follow you and to be your servants and your ministers here in this time. Thank you, Lord. I pray in this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together before we get into the message time, and that would be ancient words. This is a word celebrating that, or a song celebrating that even though the, the scriptures are ancient, uh, they're still very much relevant to us today. Let's sing this. Please stand as we sing together. Holy word, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. Sound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Thank you very much. Please be seated and turn in your Bibles once again to the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> What advice would you give, or maybe I should say, did you give, to uh, any of your girls when they were considering a potential spouse? Now, maybe you've got a daughter and you've thought about this, or maybe uh, you've got a niece or a granddaughter or, or something like that. But what advice would you give them 
if they were considering a potential spouse? Well, obviously you would tell them uh, you need to get to know them, right? Make, make sure you get to know this person. Of course, how, how? What do you mean by that? And usually we mean get to know them on a little bit deeper level, right? Uh, I mean, because if they're a, a boyfriend or from school or from college or whatever, uh, you can know them just on the happy time, you know, when we go out on dates or when we're doing fun things at school. Uh, but it needs to be deeper than that, doesn't it? So you would tell them, get to know them. Uh, for instance, you might tell them, you need to find out some facts about this particular person. For instance, what about their family? Uh, what do you know about their family? Uh, what do you know about their history? And, and, and I'm not saying any of those things would be deal breakers, but they would, they would let you know things, right? I mean, if the, guy, if the guy was an axe murderer in high school and he killed his whole family, it'd be nice to know that, right, uh, before they started dating him. I know that's a bit extreme, but uh, you would want them to get to know a little bit about, about them. What, what about their family? Uh, for instance, what about their home life? Uh, do, they, do they come from a broken home? Uh, do, they, do they know, for instance, how to, how to raise kids? If they're going to be your spouse, you might have kids. What kind of parenting have they been taught? Have they witnessed uh, growing up? Now, again, none of those are necessarily deal breakers. I know that people can learn and grow and and so forth, uh, and all that's good. But you would want them to try to know just a little bit about those things. Did they have any legal problems? You know, that sort of thing. I even know people that are so concerned about finances, they want the, the, uh, their girls to check into this guy's finances. Is the guy living in debt up to his ears? Is he going to, once you get married, are you going to be pulled into debt? Uh, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, so, yeah, you want them to find some facts. Uh, you might also tell them, uh, what is his present lifestyle? You know, well, what is his present lifestyle? How does he live now? How does he conduct himself? How does he treat other people? Uh, when you see him around, for instance, elderly people, how does he treat elderly people? Is he, is he selfish or is he kind? Is he willing to, to put out of, him, of himself or does he always want his way and things to go the way he wants them to? Don't you think those would be important things to know? Sure. Sure they would be. Uh, you might ask her to ask him about his future plans. What's, what's he planning on doing? I mean, if he wants to go live on the beach somewhere and be a beach bum and just whack surfboards all day long, okay, that, that would be all right. But is that really a family life that you want? You know, you, you want to know what, what kind of things is he looking into? Well, the reason I bring all this up is the Apostle Paul is, uh, is trying to teach the Ephesians so far some things about God. And by that, I mean God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's teaching them different things about that. And now he wants them to grow. He wants them to not only see those things, you know, be, be religious, if you will. He wants them to learn about those things and internalize those things and put them to work in their life. So what we're going to see here in this passage here is Paul's going to pray a prayer for them. Uh, now that he's taught them some of these things, mentioned what the Spirit done, he's going to pray. And the biggest part of his prayer is that he says, I want you to know God. And, and that means more than just knowing some facts. That means actually having a relationship uh, with him. So we're going to look at some of those things as we go. We've already read uh, in verses 15 through 23 of Ephesians chapter 1, so I won't read that again. But I'd like to look at Paul's prayer here. You'll see he begins... In uh, verse 15, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And he's going to tell them now what specifically he's praying for them. But there, there are a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, he's talking about genuine believers here. He says, I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are people who understand that Jesus died on the cross. And, and they understand that they can come to him by faith and receive forgiveness of sins and be made a part of God's family. So he sees their faith, but he also sees signs of their faith. And in this particular instance, he says, not only did I hear about your faith, but I hear about your love for all the saints. Did you know your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ is a, uh, a, a sign of what type of a spiritual relationship you have with God. In fact, if you were to go over into the book of 1 John, he would even tell you if you don't have love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, 
there's something deficient about you. Let me read this for a minute, for a moment. He says uh, in 1 John 4:11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And he goes on to say and argue in the book of 1 John that if you don't have love for the brothers and sisters in Christ, that's just a sign that you're not a true believer in the first place. And so it is an important thing. Well, Paul sees that in the lives of the Ephesians here. In John 13, 35, Jesus said this to his disciples, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So that's an important thing. So Paul saw a group of people that not only claimed to have received the gospel of Jesus Christ, but there's evidence in their lives that they are genuine believers as they're living together and so forth. So Paul, in his prayer, first of all, he gives thanks for them. Uh, but then he starts making some requests, and I want to look and see what specifically some of those requests are. And we're going to uh, see this in verse 17. And I want to do something uh, a, a little different, I suppose. If you look at verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I want to do something different here. I want to turn that verse around, and I want to start from the back. And work up to the main two main things uh, that, that I would like to talk about. And I think it will clarify what we're looking at. The first thing at the end of this verse is he says, um, uh, in the knowledge of him. I don't know about you, but when I first read this, I just read right over that. I was looking at some of the other big words that were going on in that sentence. And I read to the next verse. And I completely missed the fact that what Paul is saying here is, I want you to have a knowledge of him. And, and you need to be growing. Uh, the particular words that are used here uh, talk about an ongoing relationship. You need to be growing in your knowledge of him. Now, here's a question. Who is the him referring to? You know when you look at a sentence, and sometimes if you've got a couple different uh, prepositions going on, in other words, you wonder, okay, who is this referring to? It, uh, for instance, in verse 17, is he talking about uh, Jesus Christ? He says, uh, or is he talking about God the Father? Now, he's praying to God the Father. He made that clear. But what he talks about in your knowledge of him, is he saying in your knowledge of Jesus or in your knowledge of the Father? Probably uh, being a little nitpicky here. I, I, think, I think you could easily say both. And you could lump the Holy Spirit in there as well as your knowledge of him. Um, but there is uh, something else that he says later in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says this. Um, in verses 11 and 12, he's talking about how God has, has given the church and how important the church is in our lives. And God has given leaders to the church, pastors, teachers, and, and so forth. But then he says, here's what the real purpose is in verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful planning, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So th this knowledge that Paul is talking about, where, where we should be gaining this knowledge in, in, uh, about God, is, is about the Lord Jesus Christ, about God the Father. But we need to be gaining. This is a knowledge that's more than just abstract facts. And, 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 and frankly, there's a lot of people that do that. If you, if you do much in, in the light of uh, a religious reading, uh, like, like for instance, I went to seminaries, had to read all kinds of authors from way back when. And there's some of them you're reading, you're wondering, why does this person even claim to be a Christian? They're, not, they're, they're blasting the gospel. They're blasting the Bible. They don't believe the Bible is God's written. You wonder, why are they doing all that? Well, these are people that know a lot of facts. These are people that know a, a lot of words and a lot of uh, things. And they're just in it for, for the sake that maybe they just like studying and they like pursuing a certain course of, of information. But it's not real to them. I mean, why do they even do that? Well, we're not talking about someone that just knows a lot of facts. Rather, this is talking about someone who knows God personally. And what Paul is saying here, and we're going to put it together as we go, is he's praying that we would get these things that we're going to talk about in a minute so that we could grow in our knowledge of God, grow in our relationship of him, knowing him personally and knowing him intimately. Now, if I were to ask, do you know God? Uh, I mean, most of us would raise our hands and say, well, yeah, I, I know God. But then if I were to ask, do you intimately? 
And if you were, if you were uh, uh, being uh, truthful with yourself, maybe you'd be like me and you'd have to say, well, how, how intimate really am I? I mean, it's easy to know facts, especially as a pastor. I, I have to prepare and preach and teach and know those things. But how, how much do I really know God? How much have I grown to really know Him? How much of a relationship do I have with Him? Right? And so that's the thing that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, there's a saying. I remember the saying from the early days of my Christianity where it said, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Would people really be able to see that if they watched you and they watched the way you carried out your faith, they watched the way that you, you lived your life? And I realize some of that's private and people aren't going to pick up on all those things. But would people really be able to see it? Would that reflect it? In uh, James chapter 4, James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, what, what are you doing to draw near to God? What are you doing to foster a a relationship with him? Well, obviously we have to learn. It needs to all be based on scripture. Uh, There's lots of spirituality out there uh, where people are pursuing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with what the Bible's talking about. So yeah, we need to learn those things. But do you spend time with God? Um, Used to be, uh, years ago, that churches would really push the idea of having what we call daily devotion, Right? Uh, Now, we don't want to be legalistic, and so we're not saying that if you don't do daily devotion, something's wrong with you. We would never want to necessarily do that. But the reason people started having that is because it was helpful to them, helpful in their relationship with God. You know, uh, we uh, we used to have some daily breads here. We don't have them now because you can do all that online. You can go to odb.org, our daily bread, odb.org, and they'll give you the daily reading. And they'll give you a, a scripture passage that you can read. And then they'll give you a, a, a little devotional thought about that passage. That's a good one. There's actually several others. Go to our website. And on our website, we have a number of other ones that are listed. Some of them are video related, where they'll give you a daily video uh, devotional thought. But do you do any of those things? What, what, what do you do about those things in order to help you grow to know God more? For you to grow to... Um, Learn about him, but grow in him and relate with him. Do you do those things? Uh, we could talk about prayer, obviously. Prayer, prayer is a hard thing, isn't it? Prayer is actually pretty difficult to do because it's, it's more of a spiritual-oriented activity, and that, that's hard for us to do. But do you spend time with the Lord? Do you follow the Lord? Do you, once you see the things that he has for you, are you putting them into practice? And in fact, that's really what Paul's going to do with the Ephesian letter. Uh, he's going to, in the first three chapters, he's going to be talking about uh, just some abstract ideas uh, about, about our faith. But then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he's going to put them into practice and give us very practical ways of living that out. Uh, we're going to see that. But, but are you trying to live out that faith? Here's another idea when you talk about growing close to God. We, we spend a lot of time sometimes talking about suffering. Now, why is suffering? Some people just want to say, well, suffering's unfair and, and, and they don't like it. And, and, and I get why people think that. But we, we can tell. We've been around long enough. Most of us are old enough to know. We've seen suffering in the lives of God's people. Why does God allow suffering? God's certainly powerful enough to stop it if he wanted to, isn't he? Yeah, he has the power to do that. But he doesn't. Why does God use suffering? Well, I think God used suffering because it helps to draw us near to him. A lot of times we're so busy with everything else, we're thinking about everything else, we're just going on about our lives, and I believe God many times brings suffering into our lives so that we have to stop, and we have to think, and we have to relate to him. That, that's all part of getting to know him. Some of the people with the strongest faith have gone through some of the uh, deepest waters that you and I might not want to go through. Some of you have gone through uh, some of those things. But I believe it's all part of the process. God uses those He wants us to get to know him. And that's what Paul is praying here, that uh, we would grow in our knowledge of him. Now the question is, is how do we go about doing that? Now we'll back up again in verse 17. And Paul says he prays to the the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, uh, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge of him or in your growing and you're growing in your knowledge of him, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, there's a couple of questions here. What does he mean by the word spirit? Is it a capital S, spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, or is it little s, meaning having to do with us and our spirit? 
Uh, what's he actually talking about? And that's a fair question. I read a number of people here that, uh, that would argue that uh, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, that he needs to give you the Holy Spirit. Well, it's true that the Holy Spirit guides our understanding of the Scriptures. And, of course, he's an important part of the process. We need the Holy Spirit's work in our lives to help us understand. If we're going to read Scripture, we need him to help us understand it. If we're, if we're going to uh, try to apply it in our lives, we need him to help us to, to know how to do that and so forth. All that is true, but we already have the Holy Spirit. When, when, when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you were given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptized you into the church. You've already been baptized by the Spirit. That's not some moogly-googly thing. It's a thing that he did for you. He placed you within the church. And, and now you have the Spirit living within you. And so, would Paul have to pray that we would be given the Spirit? I don't think so, because we've already, we already have him. I believe what Paul's talking about here has to do with our spirits, that we would have a disposition or an attitude, and that's what he's getting at. And here it says the disposition or the attitude of wisdom and revelation as we grow in our knowledge of God. Uh, he wants us to grow. Paul is actually praying that God would incline our hearts toward wisdom and understanding, so that we could draw nearer to God. He wants to incline our hearts in that direction. Well, well he wants to incline our hearts in wisdom. What, what exactly is wisdom? Well, wisdom is more than just knowing facts. Wisdom is knowing the facts, but then being able to take those facts and use them properly. Use them to the best of your ability. That's what wisdom is. You know, you can have a smart person and you can have a wise person. I'd take the wise person any day. Because they take what they know and they use it to the the most advantageous way, and so forth. That's, that's what wisdom is. And we're going to be uh, given this later as we go. Paul's going to challenge us, especially in chapters 4, 5, and 6, on how to use this information that he's given us right now to uh, use it to live our lives in the most advantageous way. We're, we're going to see that. But then he says, not only a spirit of wisdom, but a spirit of revelation. Do any of your translations have a different word there rather than revelation? Uh, one particular translation I saw had the word understanding. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. Because when you look at the word revelation, the word revelation can be a technical term. Our scriptures are given to us by revelation, where God has revealed to us the truth. And, and that's revelation. But we can't know anything about God except for what he has revealed to us. And so the scriptures are certainly a part of revelation. But the word, the word here translated revelation also means to lay bare the truth. And so what I think, I think the, a better word for here instead of, of wisdom and revelation would be wisdom and understanding. And wisdom and, uh, and being able to think through these things. In other words, it's taking uh, something and being able to open it up and understand it. Um, and he, if you'll look at the very next phrase, he actually kind of shows that in verse 18. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So I, think, I think that's exactly what he's getting at. Paul is praying... That we would be given a spirit of wisdom and understanding. In other words, Paul has just given us all this information about how God has worked in our life. How the, the Father has worked, how the Son has worked, how the Holy Spirit has worked and is working. And Paul wants us to have wisdom with that. We, we need to take that information and not just simply go, oh, that, that's nice. No, it needs to translate into something. He wants us to take that information and use it in a wise way. But he wants us to be wise about it and be understanding. He wants us to look deeper into these things. Now, we need God's help in order to do that. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit is still a part of this. We need the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to uh, draw us closer to God, to allow us to see the truths that are there, and allow us to see how those truths impact our lives. Well, one of the knocks on Christianity is that people out there see that a lot of times we come and we hear truth and we hear uh, great uh, concepts and so forth, and then we leave the doors and we go out and we're no different than anybody else. Well, and that's a problem. Well, Paul is saying, no, as you grow in your knowledge of God, it should be different. You should, you should be growing in your wisdom and in your understanding of these things so that you can learn more about what God has planned uh, what God is doing now, how we fit into that whole process, uh, we certainly need those things. Um, 
We need to apply ourselves to understand scriptures. We need to apply ourselves to um, put the scriptures to work in our lives. Uh, we need to see what God is doing to us. We need to relate to God. And we need to actually strive to have that relationship with him. Remember, as James 4 said, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That should be the idea. Now, in order to do that, we need God's help. Paul's prayer is going to go on a little farther here. Paul's going to pray that with this in mind, with us having a spirit of wisdom and revelation and having our understanding open, we need to understand the things that God has done for us. Now, Paul's already talked about these things. He's talked about them earlier in the chapter where he's talked about what the Father has done, what the Son has done, what the Spirit has done. And, and so, therefore, he moves into verse 18. And in fact, one of the things I saw that was uh, I was reading a study on, on how they translated some of these words. And in verse 18, they said, really, you could put the word sense. Since the eyes of your understanding are enlightened... Then he goes on and he mentions several of these truths that we need to deal with. So since uh, we are learning to use wisdom and understanding and applying these things, consider these things that God has done. That Paul's already talked about, but we'll remind ourselves of them. First of all, he says, um, what is that hope of his calling? You go back and you think about what God has done. God has drawn us to salvation. God has, has worked out his plan so that you have come to Jesus Christ. And, and God has, has worked it out so that, so that we sense the truth of the gospel. We sense that what he has did for us and we turn to him for salvation. Okay? God has worked that out. And the reason he's done that all is because God has a plan. And he's causing it to come about. I don't know about you, but that should produce hope. The hope of our calling. God didn't simply just provide you a fire escape to miss hell. Rather, God has a plan. And he's working these things out for us. Yes, he has given us a fire, a fire escape to miss hell. That's the gospel. But it's so much more than that. And God is working out his plan. And we get to be a part of that. And that's hope. That gives us hope to keep going forward. Um, the next thing that he says is that uh, we are given the wealth of his glorious inheritance. He wants us to know that. Uh, you'll see that toward the end of uh, verse 18. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? We talked about that a few weeks ago. That if we, when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and he redeems us, that, that redemption is a multifaceted thing. On the one hand, he redeems us from the uh, slave market of sin, and he has drawn us to salvation, and we have that, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, the Lord Jesus and God the Father have a plan for redemption. And that redemption is going to continue. Or else we wouldn't even need the rest of the Bible. Why would we need the book of Revelation that shows what God is going to be doing as we move into the future and as we move into eternity? It, it, it's all there. And that's our inheritance. That's the riches of God's inheritance that he's provided for us. Not only are we saved and we, and we get to miss out on the punishment of hell, but we get to enjoy all these things that God has planned along the way. Right now we're a part of the church and God is working through the church, but we are woefully aware of the fact that we still have inconsistency. We still have uh, sin that we have to struggle against and we fight against. We know that, but we see that that's coming to an end. God is in the future going to work all those things out. You see the, the, the book of Revelation where you get the whole tribulation time where God is punishing the earth for turning away from him. But at the end of all that, you get what we call the millennial kingdom where the Lord Jesus comes and reigns. And why does he do that? Uh, for the life of me, the best way I can explain it is that he comes just to show what can happen when righteousness actually rules. When sin is overturned. And, and, and humanity actually lives for God and follows him. We're going to see that in the millennial kingdom. But then at the end of the millennial kingdom, we usher in what is eternity. And then in, in, in eternity, you, now we're in chapters 21 and 22 of the book of Revelation. And it's talking about God uh, uh, burning up the, the heavens and the earth. Well, what's here now? God's going to uh, burn it up, if you will. And he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And that's what we're going to live in for eternity. We're going to be with him. And that's where the Bible says, and God will be there. Uh, they will be his people, and he will be their God, and he will live with them. And he'll wipe away all tears. That's where we, we move into the joyfulness of all that. Well, that's the gloriousness of the inheritance that we have to wait for. The, the wealth 
of the inheritance. And again, we can think about uh, forgiveness, redemption, all things brought under Christ and under his rule, uh, living in the new heavens and the new earth. That's exciting to think about. God has all that waiting for us. And then the third thing that he mentions here is um, he mentions the extraordinary greatness of his power for us, and that comes in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us? You know what's interesting here, and 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 I'm not I'm not a Greek scholar. I do have to dabble with it some in my study and as I'm reading. But that phrase there in verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us? It was as if Paul didn't really know how to say what he was going to say, and he picked the most powerful words that he could pick. It was, it was almost like he was doubling up on adjectives and so forth to try to uh, say all this. And uh, the phrase, uh, what is the exceeding greatness? Well, that, that word exceeding greatness has to do with power. And then of his power, um, it's almost like he's, he's talking about, I want you to see how powerful the powerfulness of God really is. You know what I mean? It's, it's like he just keeps adding words to it. I mean, what he's saying is, is God has this great power that is there. It, it's almost hard to describe. However, that power is for us. Now we're going to look at that more in point three in just a second here. But God has power available for us to live our lives. Again, that's going to come important as we get into chapters 4, 5, and 6 where he starts saying now, because of all this, here's how I want you to live. Here's how you ought to be living. And how do we do that? Well, we do that with God's power. God gives us the power to follow him. God gives us the power to serve him. God gives us the power to overcome sin in our lives. And we can go on and on and on. Well, these, there's these three things that Paul wants us to know about God. And he's praying that God will... Open up our understanding so that we can see the extent of these. And that is the hope of his calling, the wealth of his glorious inheritance, the extraordinary greatness of his power. I, I copied this down. I was reading in a, there's a newer translation out there called the New English Translation. It's called the Net Bible, but it, it really has nothing to do with the Internet. But um, they give, what I like about this particular translation is they give a lot of translation notes at the bottom as to why they decided to word things the way that they word them. And, and I just wanted to read this note to you. This is, this is interesting to me. There's a natural cadence to the three genitive expressions, hope of his calling, wealth of his glorious inheritance, and extraordinary greatness of his power. The essence of the prayer is seen here. Paraphrased, it reads as follows. Since you are enlightened by God's Spirit, I pray that you may comprehend the hope to which he has called you, the spiritual riches that await the saints in glory, and the spiritual power that is available to the saints now. Thus, the prayer focuses on all three temporal aspects of our salvation as these are embedded in the genitives, the past calling, the future inheritance, and the present as power toward us who do. Uh, what Paul is saying here is you need to know all these things. They should make a difference in the way that you are going to live your life. You need to know that, uh, that God has done wonderful things in our past as he's called us to salvation. You need to know that the Son uh, has not only redeemed you, but he's got great things coming in the future as you live out your life under his salvation. And you need to know that God has also provided power for us today to live out our lives. Now, what is that power? Uh, Paul is asking that we get to know that power. But in this passage, he goes on and he explains it. Um, let me just look at There's three ideas here as Paul is pointing out exactly what this power is. In, in other words, think of this. If I'm going to live for God and God has given me power to live for him, what exactly is that power? Or, or maybe a better question would be, how powerful is that power that God is making available for me to be able to live for him? And here's how Paul describes it. First of all, he describes it uh, that it was manifested in Christ's resurrection. When Christ was resurrected from the dead, that was God's power causing it to happen. You see that in verse 20. He said, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The very power that caused Jesus to raise from the dead is, is the type of power that God has available for us. Maybe you've heard the phrase before, we need to live in resurrection power. Well, this is probably where they got that phrase from. 
But that power is there. It's the power that caused him to raise from the dead. Now you need to stop and think about that for a minute. God could raise anyone from the dead. Right? He could do that. I mean, we know, if, we, if you believe that God is, is all-powerful, which we do, uh, you believe that God could raise anyone from the dead. But there was so much more than that that happened when he raised Jesus. This was a more exceedingly powerful event that happened. Uh, Jesus had just died to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. It all started back in Adam and Eve. We're looking at it in Sunday school this morning. When Adam and Eve sinned. And because they sinned, the human race was cast under the curse of sin. And we all became sinners. We are naturally sinners. It's natural to us. And, and we have that. Well, you see that traced all the way throughout the scriptures, even through the nation of Israel and everything. I mean, sin is just so abundant all the way throughout all those things. But then you get up to the Lord Jesus Christ coming, and he died once to pay that penalty for sin. You see, Jesus did a, that resurrection power. And then not only did he die to pay the, the penalty for sins, but God raised him up to life. Why did he raise him up to life? Just because he could? No. He's doing more. He's seating him on the throne. And that's going to come into the future. We're going to see more of that. But here it says it, it put him. Let me, let me read that again to get it just right in verse 20. It says, he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and so forth. Well, the power that resurrected him from the dead, the power that is manifested in him and his headship over all creation, that's future. We're going to see that. Even in the book of Romans, it says the whole creation groans, even at the present time, waiting for God to finally do this, right? Well, it's coming. And that, that's the power that God is exhibiting. He's doing this through Jesus. God is going to completely turn everything on its ear as we know it in our creation, in our cosmos, in our world. He, he's going to completely turn all that around, and it's going to all be placed under Christ. And, and, and we're going to be able to see what it's like when righteousness reigns. And that's going to happen. But that, that is God's power that's going to cause that to happen. And then right now, we see that he's working through the church. He's working through the church and, and the body of Christ. And you get that in verses 22 and 23. The point is this, is that God has great power. God's power is immense. And he's made that power available to us as believers. That's the idea that he's getting at here. Um... When he says, uh, oh, I want to get the right, the right verse. Uh, and what is the exceeding greatness, verse 19, of his power toward us who believe? God's great power is at work in our lives as believers. And, and uh, we see what he's done in the past with his power. We, we hear what he's going to do in the future. And we see what he is doing now. That is the power that is available to us. We have what we need to live for him. We have what we need to uh, walk with God. We have what we need to be the people that God wants us to be. Now, we tend to make excuses when we fail. We tend to uh, uh, try to write it off under, under different ways. And I get that. We're probably all guilty of that. I know I am. Uh, but yet, if we truly follow God, God gives us what we need to follow him. And what Paul is saying here is that we need to get to know that. We need to get to know him. Not just know about him, but know him. Um, the Westminster Confession, which is one of the great confessions of gospel preaching churches uh, from our history, uh, one of the things it says is this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We need to glorify him, that's true. In fact, in the first part of, of Ephesians, isn't that what Paul did at the end of each section talking about the Father and praise to His glory, talking about the Son, praise to His glory, talking about the Spirit and praise to His glory. And we need to glorify them, but we need to enjoy Him forever. It really is about a relationship. We need to grow closer to Him. And as we grow closer to Him, it will affect the way our lives come out. It will affect the way that we are able to make an impact on the world around us. We need to get to know God more. We need to know Him factually. We need to know him emotionally. We need to know him experientially. We need to experience more of him. We need, we need to put it all together and draw near to him 
and as James says, he will draw near to us. Uh, lots of practical things we can do. I would challenge you to get back into the practice of doing your daily devotion. Uh, and don't worry about it if you don't do all days. Do a few days a week anyway. Uh, I, I would challenge you to try to do that. And, and, and it's amazing how that, that reading you would do, especially if you do it in the morning, how it affects the rest of your day. And you can see the truths of God coming up. I would challenge you to do that. I would challenge you to um, not be afraid to long for the future. We get enough voices telling us, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And they're trying to just tell us, just pay attention to what's here. But you know what? nothing wrong with thinking about the future. In fact, Paul has done it several times here. But we need to be encouraged about what we see coming in the future from God. Um, what we see coming in the future from, from our world can be really messy. I mean, we're in an election year, right? It's going to be an ugly year, right? I, and and we, we get all that, but that's what the world's offering up. God has great hope for us. And, and no matter what happens here, God's plans are going to still come to fruition. And, and we, need to, we need to be longing for that. And, and we need to seek God's help to live our life now. He has power that's available to us. I don't necessarily want to mean power where we're going out doing uh, magical things, mysterious things, all that. But I mean, just power. You know what's more powerful than a miracle of doing some other weird miracle that people can see? It's more powerful to heal a relationship. It's more powerful to heal that one, that one that you've been struggling with for years that you think will never get healed, but God, God gives us the, the information we need to do our part, and then he can work through those things. And, and he, I mean, God he can just help us with all those areas of our lives. Um, we need to seek his help, his power. We need to learn of him, grow in him. We need to relate with him. Uh, make it a point to try to get to know God as one of your personal friends, if you want to say. I know I don't want to, I, I don't mean to put God on a lower level necessarily, but, but that's what we're talking about, actually having that active, close, loving relationship with him. That's what Paul was praying for. And uh, that's what we need to say. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, giving us your word, how it teaches us to draw near to you. And uh, I pray that you would help us to draw near to you see the truth that you will draw near to us as well. Uh, Father, help us to learn of you. Help us to learn the facts, uh, but help us to learn experientially uh, to walk with you and to enjoy your fellowship and your leading and uh, help us to truly love you and want to dedicate our lives to you. Thank you, Father. Uh, bless us this afternoon. I'm praying in Jesus' name.